Hi everyone, welcome and welcome back to Dr. Han's Classroom. So this week's video topic is about President Biden's vaccine mandate announcement or executive order. Now I know this executive order has generated a lot of political debate on this topic. Now since I'm a scientist, I want to make this video more scientifically focused on some of the questions or concerns that has come about because of this mandate. So without further ado, let's get started. First, let's have a quick summary of what the mandate is. So basically, business with more than 100 employees will have to follow this order or submit the weekly testing result of their unvaccinated employees. Now, fail to comply will face a 14,000 fine per violation. In addition, every federal employee or contractor will have to be vaccinated and there is no test out option. Now that's approximately 100 million adults in the US and I am one of those 100 million people. But I think many of us have already been vaccinated because of the employer mandate. But that still create a few questions of concern and the first one is that how does the mandate affect recover the COVID patient with natural immunity? So about two months ago, I've talked about how natural immunity compares to vaccine immunity and the link is there, you can check that out. The short answer is that natural immunity is not bad. Although the natural immunity drops after a few months, the immunity stabilizes within a year. And this paper basically tells that up to eight months, the immunological memory are still there. And as time goes on, the length will probably be increased in showing how long that immunity lasts in naturally recovered patients. But then what we're asking here is what happens when previously infected or recovered patients are vaccinated? There are at least two studies that have looked into this question. Both of these studies basically concluded that when natural immunity to SARS-CoV-2 is combined with vaccine-generated immunity, a greater than expected immune response arises. So basically, you can think of it as a super immunity against COVID. The reason is that the memory B cells are gaining more diversity from different exposures, first exposing to the whole virus and then exposing to the uh, spike protein delivered by the mRNA vaccine. And this enabled the our B cells to be able to produce antibodies that can bind to different areas of the virus. Now with the Delta variant, I know there are increasing breakthrough infections after vaccination. So when the case is reversed, uh, what happened is that we could probably expect a similar booster immunity like having um, infection and then getting the vaccine. So what we are looking at is in this case is one plus one is really greater than two in this case, having a super uh, strong immunity against COVID when you combine infection recovery and vaccination. So here comes the ethical question. Now we know that naturally recovered patients have pretty good immunity against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And with just one additional dose of the vaccine, it can basically boost the immunity to a super high level. But when the mandate comes, we are talking about everyone in that population need to get at least two doses or maybe even three doses in the future. Now that's a lot of vaccines for people who may not need it or may not benefit as much. But when we're looking at COVID as a global pandemic, many people in the world are still lack vaccine access. Should we be using additional doses for people that may not need it? That's a question that we have to ask ourselves. Now here comes to the second question, how will the mandate affect the booster or the third dose decision? 
Uh, when you're looking at the decision for the third dose or booster dose, no matter how you call it, we need to look at efficacy and safety. And so far, the Pfizer vaccine is only approved for the two-dose regimen, and the third dose is still under emergency use authorization, and it will require a supplemental biological license applications to prove its efficacy and safety. And according to the press announcement from the FDA, Pfizer has already submitted their supplemental biologics license applications to them for the third dose of its COVID-19 vaccine in people 16 years and above. And FDA will meet September 17th, this coming Friday, if you are watching it before September 17th, to discuss their decision on their full approval for Pfizer's third dose COVID vaccine. They also intend to release the background material to the public at least two business days before the meeting. So I will keep an eye on this in the next few days. Now notice that this uh, meeting will be webcast from the FDA website. So the link there I provide to you will probably be able to uh, direct you to the uh, meeting. It will be live streamed and if you have time, uh, everyone should uh, go look at that. And to be honest, based on everything that is happening at the government level, I don't think they would disapprove the third dose, right? So the FDA it will likely to approve the third dose for everyone above 16. And when it does, it would imply that everyone under the mandate, the 100 million people, will be required to receive the third dose eight months after their second dose to be considered as fully vaccinated. Now, even though the FDA approval would imply the vaccine is safe and effective for the most part, but it's still hard to argue mandating the third dose could benefit the lower risk population. And here is the big dilemma for us to think about again is that people could benefit most from the third dose are people who are over 65 years old or older people in general and with other health risk factor. But at the same time, they are not the major workforce out there. However, the 100 million people who are covered under this mandate are working and a lot of them are less than 65 years old. So that is a problem. Like we are mandating the vaccine for people that may not most benefit it again. And we are leaving out some elderly people who could or who should use a third dose. Now, so that is something to think about and also lead to our next question. So far, we've only been talking about Pfizer and Pfizer, I know that, and how will the mandate affect people who had received the Moderna or the Johnson Johnson vaccine. Now, in fact, I received a Moderna vaccine, and actually most of the people that I know received the Moderna vaccine, and my wife had the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And so far, both Moderna and the Johnson Johnson COVID-19 vaccine is still only under emergency use authorization. And we know that there is no direct safety efficacy data on mixing COVID vaccine yet because there's still a clinical trials that is going on and trying to determine the um, efficacy and safety about mixing vaccines. And here is a direct quote or statement from the CDC website is that COVID vaccines are not interchangeable at this time because the data on safety and efficacy of a mixed product series have not been evaluated. So for Moderna and Johnson Johnson COVID vaccine recipients to be considered fully vaccinated in the near future and comply to the mandate, the FDA will have to follow some same routine procedure um, and both vaccines would need to be first approved for their original dosing regimen, that is two dose for Moderna and one dose for the Johnson & Johnson. And they would also need to submit another application for their booster dose or their next dose at the very least 
these it need to be uh, uh, authorized for emergency use. And this process does take time and require rigorous review. Now, when we are talking about reviewing the data, I think this is even more ambiguous now for the science part. Is the FDA settling for less? Now, what we are looking at here is a table from a journal that I pull from the British Medical Journal. Now, it, it provides a nice summary of what is the original endpoint or primary endpoint of all the clinical trials that was happening with all the COVID-19 vaccine. Now notice the original Pfizer COVID vaccine phase 3 study primary endpoint is to prevent symptomatic COVID-19 infections. And I highlighted in the box, circled it, that's for Pfizer. But when you're looking at Moderna, AstraZeneca, Janssen or Johnson Johnson, and even other vaccines that are not available in the uh, US, we're still looking at yet yeah, the why. They are only looking at prevention of symptomatic disease during their phase three trial. So that is the primary endpoint. And unfortunately, with the Delta variant and the waning effect of the antibodies, we know that vaccinated people now are having breakthrough cases, and we don't even know uh, the precise number for mild and moderate uh, cases in the vaccinated populations on a national level because the CDC are not tracking anymore. Right now, the focus on vaccines seems to be preventing severe disease, hospitalizations, and death, which is still very, very important. And we know that uh, one of the latest report, unvaccinated people having a higher risk of dying uh, about 11 times. Now, but at the same time, when we're looking at the clinical trial design, uh, in their phase three trial, they are not looking at these uh, um, severe disease hospitalizations and deaths as their primary outcome. Hmm. So there is a little bit discrepancy between what they were trying to do and now what is happening at this given time. Now the question is, is the FDA shifting the finishing line for Pfizer so that it can get approved? Well, could that be the reason for the two experts to resign from the FDA panel? Now, that is something for us to think about again. And uh, the last question I think a lot of you will ask, how would the mandate affect people wanting a non-mRNA vaccine that is not a Pfizer or not a Moderna? And back in June, I made a video about Novavax, which is a protein-based vaccine. And I have seen a lot of people left comments and hoping to get Novavax vaccine because it is more traditional technology. And just this Friday, the company announced that they're still on track for emergency use authorization application with the FDA in the fourth quarter. And part of the reason for the delay is the manufacturing challenge. And in fact, it takes a lot more steps and time to make a purified of any type of proteins in the lab than synthesizing mRNA or even DNA in the lab. Now here comes to concerns and question again. When the mandate requires more people to be vaccinated, it means fewer and fewer people would be eligible for the Novavax COVID vaccine. And it would likely upset many people who are really hoping to get this vaccine instead of the mRNA vaccines. Now as a result, Novavax will probably find its market outside of the US and maybe only as a boost to shot in the states. So clearly, the non-political debates or concerns on this topic is more than the five points that I just talked about. And I would really appreciate if you could leave me a comment and let me know what you think. And like I said at the beginning of this video, the vaccine can boost the immunity of recovered people to a very high degree. But the question is, do we really need that additional boost when many parts of the world still lack vaccine access. I know this is a very heavy topic, and as much as I respect everyone's individual choices, our government appeared to hold a different opinion at this point. 
Anyhow, that is all for this week. And if you would like to continue to follow my COVID-19 update and learn more about other health science topics, please consider subscribing to the channel. This channel needs your help to reach more people. And that's all for this week. If you enjoy this content, please comment, like, and share. And I'll see you in my next video. Meanwhile, please stay safe and healthy. Bye.